Hey, welcome back to week two, I guess it's week one, of Bible Study Fellowship. We are getting started this week with our examination of the kingdom divided. We're going to be looking at the end of Solomon's reign. But before we do that, we're going to grapple with some bigger questions about what we're looking at this year. We're going to think about the Bible, we're going to think about the Old Testament, and we're going to think about the relationship of the people of Israel to uh, their God, the God of the universe, the God of the Bible, before we take a look at uh, our passage in First Kings. Let me open us in prayer, and we'll jump right in. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for bringing us together, for giving us the opportunity to look at your word. Lord, you have gone uh, through great lengths to preserve it for us over the millennia, and thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that we have to study it uh, with the help of your Holy Spirit. We ask your blessing upon this evening, and I pray, Father, that you would fill our hearts with your wisdom so that we could live lives that would be worthy of the calling that you have placed upon us. Amen. So we're sort of wrapping up the time in uh, the United States of summer vacation, where maybe during the summertime, people traveled, they were on holiday, and one of the things that sometimes people do is they'll go on to amusement parks, and perhaps at the amusement park, there's a roller coaster if you've been in line for a roller coaster, they, they have certain disclaimers and warnings that they issue on your way in. Sometimes it's spoken, sometimes it's printed, sometimes it's both. But uh, one of the things is, you know, always keep your arms and legs inside the vehicle at all times. If people that are uh, expectant mothers or people with heart conditions or people with chronic back problems should maybe consider not riding. If you have loose items... Perhaps you want to stow them in a locker or put them into your pocket. And as you work your way through the long line, potentially, to ride this roller coaster, you'll, you'll receive that warning again and again and again uh, up until the time when you actually get onto the ride uh, to begin your, your journey. And, and so if you've been to a roller coasters before, you know, these warnings, you, you sort of know what to expect. You know what's going to happen when you go on the ride and you sort of know like, you know, yeah, it's going to be jerky and dropping and elevating and maybe we'll go upside down. And so it's a reminder. It's a reminder of what's coming. And perhaps uh, you haven't been to amusement park since last summer and you're like, oh, yeah, that's right. I should put my glasses or my wallet or my mobile phone into a locker so I don't lose it. Maybe if you've never been on a roller coaster before, these these warnings are are key information for you to know. You know, yeah, I, okay, I've never been on a roller coaster. What should I do with my my wallet or my car keys or my glasses before I get onto the ride? Those disclaimers uh, for the person that's initiated, it's a reminder. But for the person that's brand new, uh, it's critical information about what is going to happen as you board the roller coaster car. So as we begin to look at the the passage of 1st and 2nd Kings and as we begin to examine the divided kingdom, uh, we're starting off with some reminders, some disclaimers, I don't maybe warnings is the wrong word, but there's a couple of items that we're going to talk about to understand to give us some context of what this journey uh, in our Bible study is going to look like, and uh, and so as we as we as we look at this, as we as we come and as we think of these questions, we're going to examine as we look at the passage uh, in Kings tonight. I think one of the things that we're going to learn or be reminded of is that God's word reveals and reminds us of how to live as His people. God word God's word reveals and reminds us of how to live. As his people, so I wanted to think about. There's sort of three questions that have that have been underlying uh, some of the some of the issues that we've been grappling with in our study up to this point. So one of those is really the idea of what's the reason that people would want to study the Bible. What are some of the benefits of studying the Bible? It's sort of like one overarching question. A sub point of that is what is the benefit of studying the Old Testament? That's another, it's question number two. And then the third question is really like, what's the deal with Israel? Who is this people? What's going on with them? 
and and why are they mentioned so frequently in the Bible? And so those three questions are going to sort of form our first division tonight. We're going to just wrestle and think about those three questions. And then in our second division, we're going to look at uh, our, our passage in 1 Kings, 1 Kings 11. The kingdom is still unified with Solomon, but we're going to see tonight uh, sort of the seeds of the, the division of the kingdom that's going to happen after Solomon's reign is done. So that's where we're going tonight. Let's start off with those three questions that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the first one is really, you know, the perspective on what's the reason, what's the benefit, what's the value of studying the Bible? What does it look like to study the Bible? What's the benefit of studying the Bible? And maybe who are some of the people that that have done this in the past that we could look to and understand? Uh, one of the places that we that we went in our lesson was we thought about David. Uh, David, as Solomon's father, was a, a contemporary of Solomon. He was alive at the same time. He would have had access to some similar biblical resources, scriptural resources. Certainly the Bible that you and I use today looked a lot different from the one that David and Solomon would have interacted with. Uh, but David ha- offers us a perspective on studying of God's word, and we saw that in Psalm 19, uh, in, in a, many ways in Psalm 19, but is specifically in verse 7, David says that the law of the Lord is perfect and refreshing for the soul. And so as David studied the Bible, he experienced refreshment. He experienced a bunch of stuff. So look at Psalm 19 in detail to see many of the emotions uh, and and, uh, benefits that David received from studying God's Word. If we look around at some of the other psalms that David wrote, uh, if we just go back to the previous one, Psalm 18, uh, David points out that the Lord's Word is flawless, and he shields all who take refuge in him. So as David studied, he was seeing the perfection and the the interconnectedness and and the, the beauty of, of the Lord's word. And so he wrote that in Psalm 18, the Lord's word is flawless. Way back in Psalm number one, uh, David's, David implied or indicated that the man, blessed is the man, and it could be the man or the woman, whose delight is in the law of the Lord, who meditates on his law day and night. If we expand even in the Psalms outside of David, we could look at Psalm 119, uh, you know, this, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Uh, and so, you know, as David and as other psalm writers were, were considering the law, the scriptures of God that they had at the time that they were alive, you know, the place where they ended up, and if we look at Psalm 19, we can see this, you know, as David studied God's word, he confessed his sin, he humbled himself before God, he wanted to be prayerful throughout the day to be reminded of who he was and who God was. And, you know, as I was looking at David's words and David's celebration uh, and the heart that David had for God's word, the conclusion that I came to or the question that I was asking myself is, you know, I, I must be doing Bible study wrong because David is so enamored, uh, so overwhelmed with the beauty and the majesty of, of the scriptures that he had in his day that I, I feel like as I approach God's word when I'm, you know, when I'm tired or when it's the last thing that I want to do or when I'm reluctant or even angry about having to spend time in God's word, it, it really uh, challenges me and it rebukes me to see David's heart as he was willing to interact with the word of God. And so really my prayer for myself and my prayer for us is that God would help us to be uh, better students of his word and to appreciate it and to be to fall in love with it the way that David did. Uh, I began to grapple with, you know, what is it going to look like for me to engage with God's word, to study God's word, and to have that be more like what David did. And that's something I'm going to be working on this year. Other people who appreciated God's word were New Testament authors if we think about the authors of the New Testament, whether it would be Matthew or whether it would be John or Peter or James uh, or Paul, uh, they, the scriptures that they had access to would have been the Old Testament. And certainly uh, there is a lot of great material. It's wonderful to experience and to see the life of Jesus and the work of the Holy Spirit uh, and you know, the establishment of the church 
that we see in the New Testament. It is uh, majestic, and there's good reason to study the New Testament, but those New Testament writers, the, the scripture that they had was the, was the Old Testament. And so when they were quote, quoting scripture to prove their points, they were looking back into many of the places that you and I are going to be studying as we go through the kingdom divided. You know, one of the things that we like in American culture, and I don't know if this is true everywhere, but if we have the opportunity to buy the same shoes as Serena Williams, or if we can, if we can get the same soccer cleats as Christian Ronaldo, or if we can wear the same cycling gear or get the same bicycle equipment as a famous cyclist, uh, we, we, we want to do that. And, and, and it's true that people who are marketing goods to us will say like, you know, this is the, these are the same cleats, the same design of cleats that uh, Christian Ronaldo wears when he plays soccer. And so that, that's exciting to us. We, we're like, I, I can have the same cleats that I can play soccer with when, or football, for those of you outside of the U.S., uh, I can have the same cleats as Christian Ronaldo has. And, and I think, like, one of the things that we can have is, like, as we look at the Old Testament, this is the Bible that Jesus had. This is the Bible that Paul had. And so uh, they were so, it was so ingrained into their hearts and in their minds, and, and certainly we see this in Jesus, that as Jesus faced temptation from Satan in Matthew chapter 4, after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he took comfort in the words of Deuteronomy that Moses spoke to the nation of Israel. We, we talked a little bit about Deuteronomy last week and how it sort of colors, uh, it gives us a lens for 1st, 2nd Kings. But, but Jesus was able to quote passages of Scripture as he defended his choices and reasons for not giving in to Satan's temptation. Friends, if I had not eaten for 40 days, I would, I would be maybe hard-pressed to list, you know, five books in the Bible and, and here is Jesus and some of these other New Testament authors who were so immersed in, in the Old Testament scriptures that they were able to quote passages word for word. And so uh, as, as we look at the New Testament and as we compare it to the Old Testament, certainly there are, there's beauty in both of them. But those New Testament authors were, were heavily influenced and they were great students of the Old Testament. And so we have a chance to follow in the footsteps of Jesus and Paul and Matthew uh, as they're going to uh, look at that source material to help make the points uh, that Jesus clarified in his ministry. One of the other questions that's out there that you might have as you interact with the Old Testament, because you're not going to have to read very far to be able to wonder, you know, what's the deal with the nation of Israel? Uh, why are they featured so prominently in the Old Testament scriptures? Uh, you know, certainly as we look at the book of Genesis and work our way into Exodus, the reason is, is that this was a people that God chose for himself. God chose this nation. Uh, his reasons for choosing them are not clear. Uh, that, that is not revealed to us, uh, other than to say that God chose the nation of Israel because that was the vehicle through which he would reveal his glory to the world, the Old Testament world, but also to the world that we live in today. And as we look at the, the, the pattern of the nation of Israel, we, we looked at a passage in our lesson that dealt with the uh, book of Isaiah, parable of the vineyard, and, and uh, we can see uh, the Lord was revealing to us the care and the nurturing that he had given to the nation of Israel, and the pattern uh, of that nation was uh, really not that different from what we're going to see in Solomon's life. There, there were moments, there were seasons of fidelity to the Lord. There were seasons of obedience. There were seasons of uh, the time when, when, when God was glorified and magnified and lifted up in the nation of Israel. But unfortunately, much of the story and the history of the nation of Israel is rejection. And uh, as we look at the end of Solomon's life, that, that really kind of mirrors some of the pattern that we're going to see in the nation of Israel, starting off strong, uh, obedient, steadfast, trusting the Lord at times— and then times of turning away, times of rebellion, uh, times when uh, they were seeking things that were contrary to what God wanted. And so the pattern in Solomon's life is going to be one that, that uh, really is reflective of what had been happening in the nation of Israel over the course of their history. And it's, it's also reflective of what we're going to see 
in the nation of Israel as we go forward. So just keep that idea of, of the nation of Israel being important, being valued, being chosen by God. Uh, and that's really what made them special than, you know, than say other nations at the time, where, whether it's the Edomites or the Egyptians. Uh, those nations were there, but the focus is on Israel because they were God's chosen people. So uh, just those three quick questions. But I think what we want to be aware of as we think about the nation of Israel is that they had this intimate experience with God. And they were still able to turn away and, and, and go their own way and worship other gods and, and just, you know, make a series of poor choices. And, you know, we have to guard against that in our lives as well. Despite the fact that we might have, you know, been in Bible study for 50 years, uh, we still have to be on guard against the temptations that will slowly lead us away from uh, the God that we desire to serve. You know, Solomon probably didn't wake up one morning and say, this is the day when I'm going to build a temple to the god Chemosh. But that day came in his life, and it was a series of compromises that he made uh, as, as he went through his life with the Lord. And I think we need to ask God that as we study his word, that he would help us identify those places where we're compromising or we're being tempted to compromise uh, in our own hearts, in our own, in our own lives. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to move into 1 Kings. We're going to look at 1 Kings 11. And we want to grapple with the question or understand what might have gone wrong in Solomon's life that resulted in him moving away from uh, the God that he served in his early days to the situation that he found himself in at the end of his life. So 1 Kings 11, I'm going to read nine verses 9 through 11 just so we can get a flavor of what's going on. Uh, verse 9 says, And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods. But he did not keep what the Lord commanded. Therefore the Lord said to Solomon, Since this has been your practice, and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes that I commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and give it to your servant." So I think, again, uh, a couple of points from this passage that I just read is that, first of all, the root problem was that Solomon's heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, right? Solomon had these two encounters with the Lord that were in-person encounters. Uh, and, and again, um, the consequence of that decision, on Sol because Solomon had turned his heart away, there were going to be consequences uh, for Solomon's earthly kingdom, um, but I, but one of the things that struck me with this was that the when as the Lord is is evaluating Solomon, he says that since this has been your practice, and the idea of practice implies that this was something that Solomon was doing a lot of, and in in fact maybe he had gotten quite good at uh, this repeated sin in his life, whether it was a justification, whether it was continuing to do it, uh, but Solomon had been practicing sinning, uh, and that was the reason uh, that God had come and was intervening. His heart had been redirected away from the God of Israel. As we look at the passage, we can see that there were three W's in Solomon's life that resulted in him turning away. Uh, it was wives, it was wealth, and it was worship of other gods, and those were the three problems that Solomon had at this point in his life. Uh, it cer certainly they were related uh, Solomon's wives were the reason that other gods and the worship of other gods was introduced. Uh, Solomon's wealth probably gave him a sense of independence or uh, 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 certainly he didn't have an experience of need the way, that, uh, the way that you and I might experience need. And so these three W's had been things that had drawn Solomon's heart away from the God of Israel and had turned him towards other lesser loves in his life, his wives, his wealth, uh, and his worship of other gods. As we look at Solomon's behavior in this, this portion of 1 Kings 11, it becomes pretty apparent to us that there is obvious visible sin, right? His, his, uh, his building of other uh, temples for foreign gods, his participation in worship of uh, deities that referred to as abominations. It's very easy for us to see the behavior in Solomon at this point that has caused a problem. But again, the, the core issue was that a long time ago, or sometime in the past, Solomon's heart had turned away. 
uh, it's easier for you and I to look at someone's behavior to evaluate what's happening in that person's life. And I imagine for some period of time, for those who were looking at Solomon, everything looked fine. He looked okay. He looked like he was doing the right things. Uh, they didn't look at him and say like, oh, well, he has clear sin in his life. There was a time when the heart had begun to change, but the behavior maybe stayed the same. Uh, and I think that this is a, this is a time uh, when we really can't evaluate the status of somebody's heart, but God can. Uh, God told Samuel in 1 Samuel 16 that people look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And so I, I think that one of the things that we want to ask God to do for us as we are studying his word is that God would examine our hearts and that God would show us and reveal to us the places where our hearts are being turned away from the Lord, the places where sin has entered, has made us hard, uh, and has made us unwilling uh, to interact and to love the God of the Bible. Because of Solomon's hardness of heart, we hear about three opponents that, re that were uh, really enabled by God to uh, arise and become obstacles for Solomon. Early in Solomon's life, early in his reign, it, it tells us that Solomon had peace on all of his borders. Whether it was north, south, east, west, or internal, Solomon had peace in his kingdom. But we, as in the second part of 1 Kings 11, we're going to read specifically about three opponents that Solomon's, Solomon had. Uh, Hadad the Edomite, Rezon the son of Eliada, Jeroboam, Jeroboam the son of Nabat. And so these three men, who, who we have little stories about each of them in the passage, we can, we can learn more about them. We learn their origin stories, and we know that these men uh, were, were, were enabled by God to provide opposition to Solomon. Uh, I think that one of the questions we want to we wanna grapple with is, what was the reason for the opposition? Why did God allow political opposition uh, to arise in Solomon's kingdom. What was the point? Was it persecution of the, of the nation of Israel in general, or did God have some spiritual objective? And it, and it would seem that uh, if we look at the history of Israel again, you know, if we, if we think about the nation of Israel, uh, God raised up opposition at many times in Israel's history, uh, one for the purpose of rebuke, but the main reason that God allowed opposition to arise was to draw the nation, draw the people back to the right worship of God. Sometimes when our lives are easy, uh, when, when everything's going well, uh, it can be very easy for us to fall into patterns of self-confidence, self-trust, self-rule that actually is uh, incredibly harmful for us as, as followers of God. Uh, and so in this situation, this opposition that God raised up, it's a holy opposition, but the goal is to draw Solomon and the nation of Israel back, to turn their hearts back to the Lord. The principle for this section that we're in is that people are guided by their hearts. People are guided by their hearts. One of the things that uh, we spent some time doing this summer is uh, we, we go water skiing on the Mississippi River, and uh, we have a 19-foot, 4,800-pound, 1986 Supra Sun Sport with the 200-horsepower V8 Ford 351 Windsor engine. It can easily pull two to three people on water skis behind it going at 30 miles an hour. So it's, a, it's, a, it's not a massive boat, but it's 19 feet long. And uh, we steer the boat with a really tiny rudder. It's about the surface area equal to a piece of paper. So big, powerful boat, lots of horsepower. You know, really, when it, when it goes, you feel it. And there's this little tiny rudder that, that directs the boat where we want it to go. And in the same way, um, our heart is the thing that's going to direct our, our focus in our lives uh, as, we, as we go through life. And so we saw the dangers in Solomon's life when his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel. And so the question that you and I want to ask ourselves is, what is the love that our heart is steering us toward? 
Uh, is it steering us towards the God of the Bible? Is it steering us towards uh, the obedience that, that God asks of his people? Is it steering us towards forgiveness of sin? Is it steering us toward faith in Christ? Or is it steering us towards a lesser love like Solomon had for one of those three W's, women, wealth, and worship of other gods? And I think it's good for us to grapple with the question of what do we do when opposition occurs in our lives? Uh, do, we, do we look to resolve that opposition through our own means? Uh, that's probably what Solomon wanted to do, right? I mean, it tells us in the passage that Solomon tried to kill Jeroboam. Jeroboam was an opponent to, to Solomon, and Solomon was going to get rid of him with his earthly power. And sometimes that's what we want to do. When opposition arises in my life, uh, I just want to deal with it. I want to take care of it. Um, that's my natural, my right-handed response is going to be that I'm going to use my own resources to deal with this problem when God might be placing that opposition in our lives to draw us back to him. I think a good question for me to ask and a good question for you to ask is, Lord, what do you want me to learn? What do you want me to do as I face this opposition? Uh, I think the good thing for, for you and for me is that we're back into Bible study fellowship. We're back in God's word. We're, we're going to be looking at a lot of it in this study. And I think there'll be many opportunities that we'll have for God to, to redirect us, for God to turn us back to him and away from those loves that, that might be drawing us away uh, from the, the blessing and the, the blessed life that God has called us to. I think we can say that Solomon had gotten out of the practice of studying God's word. David was good at it, and David even had struggles in his life. Um, But but definitely, as as we're coming out of the summer, uh, one of the things that I experienced in my first weeks back in BSF is uh, this this, uh, filtration of my heart through the word of God. It's, it's It's a good thing about coming back to BSF, but it's also a hard thing. Uh, as, as the Bible begins to reveal some of the places in my own heart that are filled with sin and that are hard towards the direction of the Lord. So welcome back to BSF. It's great to have you back. It's great to be back. And it will be even better to see the things that God is going to do in your heart and in my heart as we study his word. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you just don't leave us alone and adrift when we are off course Thank you for the way that you uh, worked to call Solomon back to yourself. Lord, we're going to see you do it again and again as we go through the book of Kings. Uh, Thank you, Lord, for uh, the wisdom that we can can gain uh, from studying your word. And I pray, Father, that you would do a work in all of our hearts to turn us back towards you. pray all this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week. See you next Monday.